Thank you very much, uh, Michael. And um, I'm delighted to introduce our final session uh, this morning, which is about value for money. This is an extraordinarily important issue for uh, the office for students. We have a statutory uh, general duty to consider the issue of uh, value for money. It's in our regulatory framework. And it matters, it matters very much for students who are investing so much time and energy uh, and money in their studies and their time at university. And yet one of the things that I think is coming over very strongly is that there is absolutely no consensus about what uh, value for money means. It means extremely different things to uh, a young student, to a mature student, to international, to uh, domestic. Uh, it, well, it may or may not, but I think one of the things we are appreciating at the Office for Students is this is an area uh, that we will need to look into and consider and understand over the years ahead in order to make sense of our responsibilities. We therefore decided at a very early stage to uh, commission some student unions to lead some work uh, to establish what students understand by value for money. And uh, we're absolutely delighted uh, that uh, Megan Dunn, who chairs our student panel, Ed Marsh uh, from Middlesex Un Student Union and Jim Dickinson from UEA uh, Student Union are going to talk to us about uh, the research that they've been leading. And this is work that we at the Office of Students will be uh, considering uh, and using as a platform to engage with this complex but critically important issue. So at this point, I'm going to hand over to uh, Megan, uh, Jim and Ed. So good value for money um, in terms of what I get out of my degree would be like lots of contact hours and if we didn't have lots of contact hours then knowing that your tutor or your lecturers um, or the academic staff are there for you. I do very much appreciate the learning process and having quality lecturers and things and you feel like you're learning something however at the end of the day you want a good job at the end of it. Yeah, I guess you do from it. I think later on down the line, uh, when you do get a job, it pays off all the time that you've spent in university and all the expenses that you've had. I think it does repay back. So I expect kind of good teaching, I hope, and then as I said before, I want, I want to get a good job at the end of it. Um, but also I've kind of chosen a degree that I um, wanted to enjoy. I was interested in it, so I enjoyed it, and I want to enjoy the degree also, so it's fine for money. I think you get a lot of life experience as well. Like, more than just, you're more than yeah, just like growing like, up as well. Yeah, you're more than just getting a degree and getting like life. Like mature enough as yeah. well, definitely. If you're spending like nine grand a year or something, you want to get uh, sort of the best or at least what's going to get you to where you want to go. Uh, well, for me, it means that if I'm going to invest a lot of money into my ed education, then when I pass out of university, I want to get something in return, like the education or the job prospect that I'll have. Because I'm paying a lot of money, it's not a little amount. So yeah, that is what it means to me. Really, I want to be looked at as a consumer, not as, not just a number and not just a student. I think that's a hard question, but I think now that I'm a fourth year, I think I have a, a nice perspective. So, if, for example, I've just done a placement year, and they've actually asked me to come back. So, obviously, I'm now leaving with a graduate job. So, in that sense, I got the value of most of my higher education back because the skills I learned here allowed me to get my placement, which then obviously allowed me to get a graduate job. So, I think that's what that means to me. going to wander up to the top and hope this uh, camera doesn't give me too many chins. So, um, hi, uh, and uh, thank you very much for being here and, and for being here for this talk. Um, as Nicola says, I am the chair of the student panel, um, and I think this is a good moment to state that it's an incredible student panel um, with an incredibly wide range of experiences of higher education um, and some people who are yet to experience higher education. Um, so it's really wonderful to be a part of this. Um, it is, oh, I've got a clicker, there you go. Um, we are not a representative body, um, and I think it is important to uh, say that. We are not the National Union of Students. We can highlight our own experiences and point to areas of interest. Um, we can commission research and define our own agenda. 
but we do not underestimate the importance of NUS and of student unions, who are the democratic and legitimate voice of students. And they work, and student unions work every day with and by and for students. And that is one of the reasons that it's so exciting that this value for money research can be done through student unions. Um, to allow students to really define what value for money means to them um, and what they think about it. So that is really students driving this agenda, uh, not any imposition from the top down. Um, and on that note, I am going to hand over to uh, Jim and Ed to talk a little bit more about the technicalities of the research. So there we go. Oh, this is me first. First year, Jim. Well, this is slick, isn't it? <laughs> so, uh, afternoon, everyone. I'm Jim. Now, um, I guess the first thing to say is that it's election season in uh, student unions. So, uh, for many of you, the posters and banners will be up. And we did some work last year to work out what the consistent themes were that were coming through on campuses. So, uh, it perhaps won't surprise you to learn that mental health was uh, top of the charts last year in student union election manifestos. But... Number two were variations on this kind of value for money theme, and we thought that was quite interesting. Um, I guess the second thing to say about this research is there are what I would call kind of ideological and political debates about the concept of value for money, uh, and they are fascinating, and I, am, I love getting involved in those debates, as do our student officers at both of our uh, student unions, but to some extent this research plays the ball where it lies. Value for money is a phrase in the legislation, it's a key aim for OFS, uh, and so we wanted to try and understand what students thought about that phrase rather than just kind of endlessly debate it. Um, I, I guess the other thing to say is that, is that we are conscious that working in the student interest is quite an interesting concept, not least because the democratic elements of the organisations where certainly me and Ed work uh, feature lots of debates about what it is to be in the student interest. And so uh, whilst OFS has to work in the interests of taxpayers as well as students, even the alignment between the interests of taxpayers and students is interesting. And so we wanted to get a sense of what students thought uh, was in their interests when you started to ask this question. Uh, okay, so what we're going to do over the next half an hour or so, and I'm conscious that there's only us between you and lunch at this point, um, is we're going to talk a bit about some research which is going to be published next week. Uh, so as of next week, you'll be able to see the full research. Alongside that will be the technical report, which will answer conscious room full of academics. There'll be a lot of questions about methodology. That will all be answered and kind of picked up in the technical report next week. So this was research that was commissioned uh, by the Office of Students uh, and led by two student unions, uh, myself as Chief Executive of Middlesex and Jim uh, as Chief of Staff at UEA Student Unions. Uh, and there were 31 student unions who were involved in um, developing the lines of inquiry and what the hypotheses were going to be. Uh, carried out by Trendens. Um, we're going to be effectively submitting it at this point to the student panel and they'll reflect on it and decide how they want to take it forward. Um, and for those student unions in the room who took part, there will be some provider level detail made available to you. A uh, few more things, a few more technical details about the uh, research. Uh, there are about 5,500 students who responded, uh, of which about 10% are recent graduates. So we thought it would be useful to get a sense of how people's perceptions of value for money perhaps change bef between uh, before being a student, whilst being a student, and then afterwards. Um, so we also asked uh, 400 uh, school students who are planning to go to university. Uh, 133 different providers uh, were responded across the range of both undergrad uh, and uh, postgraduate provision. Um, and this was carried out towards the end of January. We've been analysing the results since. Um, and the findings were also weighted uh, along various samples. Thank you, Ed. So, first of all, just to give you a sense of some of the things that student unions told us when we were, uh, in the, I guess, in the design phase before the, before the research went out for student responses. Um, first is that student unions told us that students view value for money from multiple perspectives. Uh, and I guess whilst if you only read tomorrow's papers today, uh, you might focus on the full-time undergraduate home uh, tuition fee limit. Uh, there are actually lots and lots of issues that uh, relate to this kind of concept of value for money and the 
OFS duty and students unions wanted us to try and interrogate those and so uh, supplied lots of ideas for questions to that end. Second thing to say is that uh, students unions told us that uh, when students feed back they're not just thinking about tuition fees, uh, sometimes they're thinking about their wider costs that they might face, some of which are levied by providers some of which are uh, kind of wider costs out in the community for uh, accommodation or living costs and so on. Uh, and they're also often thinking about their overall investment. Uh, and whilst we wanted to keep this to their financial investment, uh, lots of students are also feeding back to students' unions that they are thinking about the opportunity cost of higher education, uh, particularly in an environment where they get one shot. And so we, we, we were trying to reflect the kind of breadth of that. So. Uh, we have definitely thought about in the research tuition fees themselves, whether they're paid by students or not, other charges, fees and costs that are levied by providers, uh, and then students' overall investment, I guess, in their experience. I, I call app Britain. Yes. And, so and apps everyone will benefit. Not, not the phones at the ready then, people. Uh, we call app Britain. Those of you that have managed to get the app downloaded and ready, a tiny number, but nevertheless. <laughs> so there are going to be two different things that we're going to do through this session. Uh, later on, we're going to ask you some polling questions and get your responses to that. But there's also going to be a running theme as we go through. Uh, and it kind of reflects on one of the things that Shakira picked up on earlier around the fact we don't necessarily have to wait to be told what to do. There are things that we as a sector can perhaps do to be a bit more uh, proactive. Uh, and so in the app, there's a section where you can submit questions. It's quite confusing, this. The bit where you can submit questions, we actually want you to submit answers. So rather than typing in a question uh, in that section, can you type in an answer to this question? Um, and we'll go through some of them at the end, uh, some of your suggestions. So what should be done to ensure value for money, uh, to ensure students believe that they, they receive value for money? Is that, is that okay? Broadly. Some people are playing with their phones, so that's going to be fine. Uh, so now we're going to move into the polling section. So who's got the polling thing open on the phone? Great, and the first question that we want to know the answer to, the tuition fee for my course represents good value for money. So do you think that in answer to this, uh, students will have said, definitely agree, mostly agree, neither agree or disagree, mostly disagree, or mostly, uh, definitely disagree. That should pop up in the polling section. Has anybody got it? Is that happening? Okay, so in the room, uh, about 42% of people thought that students would say mostly disagree, uh, and 33% thought that students would mostly say agree. In the research that we actually carried out, oh, the answer looked like this. So 38% of students uh, who we surveyed uh, said on some level that they either uh, definitely agree or mostly agree uh, that their tuition fee represents value for money. And obviously there's a challenge kind of for us as a sector within that, uh, that the majority of students weren't able to, to answer that question positively. So what's going on behind that? Uh, well, alongside asking these uh, quality, quantitative questions, we also asked a series of qual qualitative questions. Um, and one of them um, was about why people don't believe or do believe that they get value for money. Uh, so the first thing that people said uh, is that the excess and waste of the university with regards to spending uh, it's obvious, so I can only assume um, it's a fraction of what the tuition fee actually goes towards. Fascinatingly, as we go through this, there is a real sense from students that they have a, quite a deep understanding uh, of what's going on at their institution. It, it doesn't boil down to you know, the kind of simple answers. Well, my lecturer is quite often late for my lecture. Most of them take a kind of broader view than that. Uh, £9,000 a year for uh, a degree. Are you joking? Um, I can't comprehend how the money is spent each year is used. Uh, as I get absolutely bare minimum of contact with actual members of the department. Um, somebody here has calculated how much uh, it costs per hour. Uh, but there are some positive things as well. So uh, the staff from my course are supportive, knowledgeable, and I am definitely getting good value for money. Uh, the lecturers are fantastic, and I learn and enjoy my classes. Um, and good value for money in HE, uh, in my opinion, um, means personal is personal and means high quality supervision uh, and support. Jim. So uh, we asked Trendants to try and summarise what was going on in the comments um, because this will help us generate some satisfaction rather than dissatisfaction. Uh, dissatisfaction in the comments on this question have three themes really. 
Uh, contact hours comes up again and again. Uh, second is quality of the contact. So uh, there's a whole bunch of responses where people are disappointed at the nature of the contact, either very large class sizes or people mumbling their way through PowerPoint slides, as me and Ed are doing right now. <laughs> um, and then the third theme that comes through is people just not knowing where their money goes and to some extent not trusting where the money is going. Uh, the other thing it's worth saying is that almost all of the dissatisfaction answers focus on inputs and quality of the services on offer. Um, and the dissatisfaction isn't related to outcomes like kind of graduate premium job prospects and so on. Satisfaction, on the other hand, is much broader. So when people are satisfied, they write much broader answers. And there they both focus on the quality of kind of inputs, but also career aspirations and learning goals and self-development and so on. So there's something interesting about the difference between dissatisfaction and satisfaction that comes through in the comment. Second then is we asked people quickly to uh, reflect on whether other fees, charges and costs at their university represented good value for money. Uh, you'll notice that there isn't a huge difference, although uh, the agreement uh, changes slightly. And again, we asked ourselves, so what's going on? Uh, one of the answers here, £9,000 a year for horrific organisation, then 25p to print a sheet of paper, really? <laughs> Um, accommodation has increased by 30% as of two years ago, library fees, gym expensive, canteen food is disgusting, the price for books you have to have but only look at once is disgusting, price of trips, uh, an admin fee for paying our fees for the course, um, I'm able to access everything I need at university for a reasonable price that doesn't have a negative impact on my way of living. So. Uh, there were some positives. And then another one, a lot of costly extras have been supplied or covered by the university where possible. Great library service. So again, we asked ourselves and we asked Trendants what's going on that generates satisfaction or dissatisfaction with this wider set of costs. Dissatisfaction has four themes. Unexpected charges, so things they didn't expect that they would have to pay for when they got there. Uh, what they regard as unnecessary costs, so things that they don't believe uh, they need to pay for, but people tell them they need to buy. Uh, the most obvious comment of which, by the way, is the student that feeds back uh, that there weren't any copies of the core text in the library, but their tutor was selling them in the first seminar. Uh, and there were about 250 words of, of, of real fury. Uh, a perception, therefore, of being milked to some extent. Uh, and lots of the comments, and this is the fourth theme, had an intersection with student hardship. So students that were struggling financially were talking about uh, 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 these issues. Satisfaction, then, isn't quite the reverse, although it almost is. Satisfaction was related to inclusivity of costs a perception that some of the things that they pay for were being subsidised uh, by the university's wider budgets. And then, this is the other really interesting bit, a whole bunch of comments come through where, sh where when students perceive that the university or the provider is making efforts to keep costs down, uh, they feed back positively. So that sense that the provider is interested in keeping costs as low as possible generates really positive uh, answers on this other fees and charges question. Okay, so uh, I think the final bit of quantitative data here. Uh, overall, my investment in higher education represented good value for money. Um, and actually, once you ask people to take a broader view of higher education than just the cost of tuition fee, actually satisfaction goes up. Um, and so 54% of students um, agree that overall their investment in higher education represents good value for money. Um, uh, some of the comments that related to that, uh, I feel like I could have been doing something in these three years to help further my career. Um, lots and lots, I know certainly at my institution, lots of people compare what would they have been doing if they hadn't gone to university and what position that would have left them in. So if they continued in the job that they were doing before they started studying, they almost have a kind of shadow version of themselves that's progressing through that life um, and they're constantly comparing the two, so they don't necessarily uh, just compare where they are now with where they were, they compare where they are now with where they would have got to. Um, my investment uh, has gone to waste, uh, there's no guarantee that I will make money, I am literally losing money. Um, I have taken on large amounts of debt at a very young age to fund my uh, university tuition. Uh, that sense that as much as anything the debt is psychological, so we know that you know most people in this room will 
We're very acutely aware that lots of the debt uh, isn't necessarily real in so much as it won't be repaid, but it clearly has a huge psychological impact on uh, how students perceive value for money. Um, but it also a series of good things that students have said. Uh, I've invested to increase my knowledge and skills so that I can improve my uh, visibility to employers. Um, from increasing my knowledge to shifts in my perspectives and increased opportunities, the overall investment in higher education has been good. Um, and gaining skills that you would get at home uh, other than academia, uh, you get to live away from home and to develop independence. Um, I think that there's, there's something we'll explore this a bit later on. There's something about that kind of moment of transition, that rite of passage uh, through university. Um, so overall, to kind of summarise that, uh, dissatisfaction, again, this is what Trendons have teased out of the, uh, the research for us, generally comes from uh, people being unsure about their employment prospects, and there's definitely something about the economy and this generation uh, of students, perhaps compared to some of their predecessors uh, going on there. Uh, inputs and quality, and we're going to examine that in a bit of detail in a second. And then also opportunity cost. So lots of the things at university that can provide added value actually come at an added cost once you're there. Um, and satisfaction is generally related to people believing that it's improving their employment prospects, uh, that there's learning gain, um, and that they are, are, are improving because of it, and then that sense of rite of passage uh, and adulthood. Now, just before we rattle through, and we will rattle through the next uh, few at some pace, uh, the full report will be out sometime next week. This is more of a kind of preview. What we did want to just very briefly reflect on at this, at this point is this. What you start to get by the time you get to this point in the research when you're wading through the data and that Trenton's told us about is this emerging sense of the difference between a kind of version of hygiene and motivator factors that are in the, that, that, that's in the research. So if you take some of the wider stuff about kind of career prospects and learning gain and life opportunities and what a wonderful time I had uh, at university, What's clear is that students are finding it difficult to get to that point uh, unless some of the hygiene factors are addressed, and the hygiene factors are very closely related to inputs and quality of those inputs. So things like uh, contact time, contact quality, and so on. And this starts to then run through the rest of the research in the comments like Blackpool through a stick of rock. So when you see, get to see the full report next week, it's worth having a think about that because I think quite often providers are trying to talk about what we would call here the motivator factors, but unless the hygiene factors are addressed, it ain't gonna work. Uh, okay, so uh, we also did um, a bit of um, breaking down some of the data based on provider types. Uh, distance learners have particular concerns um, about where their money is going, um, and also have a real sense of isolation, and that word features quite often uh, for students who are um, distance learners. And then when you break it down and you take the segment for small and specialist, um, there's a real frustration at comparison on facilities. You know, we're a small institution and therefore our library isn't as big as the next door big institution. Uh, and also additional costs, um, particularly art students feel a real acute sense that they pay their 9,000 pounds and then arrive at university and then are told, here's a load of things that you need to buy in order to complete your um, degree. Um, Social profile, so we also are able to break down the data based on some, some demographic factors. Uh, private and public schooling, so private stu school uh, students are far more likely, or students have been to private school, are far more likely to think that their education and their tuition fees represent good value for money, um, about 8% more likely than those who have been through uh, the state schooling system, um, and I'm sure that there's a whole variety of sociological factors that, that go into that. Um, people who receive means-tested funding, um, and come for alternative routes into HE. Also, that affects value for money. So in a second, we're going to look at where people or where students believe tuition fees should be spent. Um, one of the things that's really stark is that those who have received means-tested funding believe that tuition fees should subsidise access to education uh, activities. Those who haven't received means-tested um, funding are less likely to think that that should be a part of where tuition fees go. Um, and also amongst home EU uh, and non-EU students, uh, home students are comfortably the least satisfied actually in terms of value for money, uh, and non-EU are the most satisfied. And that's quite surprising because in many cases, of course, the non-EU fee is actually higher than the home fee and they're receiving the same education. So lots of this perhaps boils down to some level of perception rather than necessarily reality. So uh, my uh, tuition fee uh, represented good value for money. Uh, so at the top there, you can see science students, 53% um, of computer science students, 44% of uh, physics students, um, uh, 
sorry, physical sciences students do believe that their um, tuition fee represents value for money. There's probably something going on there around access to facilities and contact time. Uh, and then at the bottom there, languages students, only 28% of uh, language students. Um, and then history um, and particularly philosoph philosophy students seem to be asking the question, why? <laughs> very good. Thank, thank you very much. Here or, here or not. Also wedding, uh, available for wedding funerals and bar mitzvahs. Uh, Jim. Right, so here we go then. Arms inside the car, we're going to go as fast as possible. So, first of all, we next ask students what their fees ought to fund. And it's worth saying that students are really interested actually in the cross-subsidy question uh, and where their money goes. Clearly, to some extent, we are conscious that at the back of this, the name tuition fee is a misnomer given where the money has to go. Uh, but we were keen to find out what students thought their fees should fund and shouldn't fund. So we asked them a whole bunch of things. Uh, whether they uh, agreed, mostly agreed, were, didn't mind and so on, on a range of things that their fees should fund. So uh, near the top there are things like library resources, student health and welfare, IT resources and facilities and the campus estate. Uh, down in the middle are things like uh, bursaries, scholarships and access initiatives, capital investment and so on. And then right at the bottom uh, is wider research unrelated to your subject. We asked them about research related to their subject and that's actually pretty high, that's the fourth one down. But research not related to their subject, uh, pretty low, 31% and teaching on, on other courses, 27%. Now. It may not surprise us to learn that where students can see a direct benefit, they're highly positive. Where students are aware that there's an indirect benefit, there are lots of neither agree nor disagree and there's perhaps scope to explain. Uh, but where there's proper cross-subsidy, uh, and that's probably an unhelpful term, but that's my term, not Trentance's term, but proper cross-subsidy, uh, they're actually highly negative and that's food for thought, I think, as the, as, the debate, as the debate develops over the next year or so. Uh, the other thing we asked then uh, was whether or not they think they ought to pay for things or the provider ought to pay for things or the provider ought to subsidise things a bit. Uh, and what we've got here are three graphs, full graphs and data available in the report next week, but three graphs that show you the most popular answers for each of those categories. So entirely covered by the university are things like specialist software. I don't think that's controversial in most providers. Final year project or dissertation costs. That one's very interesting, particularly where there are significant costs, for example, in arts institutions where people have to buy lots of materials and things. Uh, essential course books, uh, criminal record checks, field work and field trips, that's also an interesting one because we know that lots of providers have to uh, warn students about that cost. Uh, entirely paid for by students, uh, stationery, that was a ringer, just to check we weren't asking something daft. <laughs> Exam resit fees, they're brutal students. Uh, accommodation, childcare and leisure and sport were the most popular answers. And then partly subsidised accommodation, leisure and sport, field work and field trips, travel to placement and printing. And that one we're guessing is quite interesting. Um, it's difficult this because it's not clear by looking at annual accounts or by using the university SORP uh, which providers are subsidising those things, which are kind of roughly flat and which are actually making a surplus from those things to put into other activity into the institution. And it may well be uh, that some of those elements are worthy of further investigation as OFS develops over the next couple of years. Okay, so uh, we've then looked a bit about the difference between kind of the inputs or experiential factors at university and the outcomes. Um, and there's definitely an ongoing debate both in this room and kind of wider, uh, further afield, about whether or not value can be derived from either the quality of a provider's services, uh, its inputs or its outcomes. Um, and students' unions were keen to find out um, which of those uh, factors most drove value for money perceptions. And I think this is probably, for me at least, the most fascinating part of um, the research. So, which factors demonstrate uh, value for money? Um, students are really high, and it Interestingly, it doesn't change from prospective to current uh, to recent graduate. Students are really high on those kind of experiential factors during their time at university. So quality of teaching, fair assessment, um, and learning resources um, such as the library feature really highly in terms of how people judge value for money. 
Um, at the bottom there, um, still fairly high, some stuff around 84% um, opportunity to, to engage with societies, 76% uh, opportunities to engage with the local community, and probably some food for thought for students' unions in there as well. And then we come into um, what factors demonstrate uh, value for money, um, and those are kind of the ones at the top. So um, at the top, you've got stuff around teaching, and then actually much lower down, uh, you get securing higher earnings and a non-graduate uh, and securing a job within six months of graduation. So some of those output uh, factors actually seem less significant uh, to students. And that, I think, is probably um, quite an interesting finding, certainly in the context uh, of the HE funding review. Um, Jim. Uh, a few other bits then. Uh, we asked students about costs preparedness, so hidden course costs, whether students were prepared for how much everything would uh, cost. This is again one that features very highly in student union research, in student union officer manifestos and so on. Um, go on over. So this is another moment to get your app out folks. Phones up the ready. Uh, when we asked students I was informed of and prepared for how much everything would cost as a student at university, do you think they definitely agreed, agreed? Neither agreed nor disagreed, mostly disagreed or definitely disagreed. Vote now. We could do some music, couldn't we? Oh well. Dum 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 <laughs> dum 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 boo. <laughs> Have we got the poll? Ah, oh, there we go. Jeez. It's exciting. This One. Is. It's like you're boom. Already. Mostly disagreed. You're quite. Uh, well, I mean, it's probably the student officers in the room that have got the app, <laughs> isn't it? So, <laughs> those of you that are the institutional visitors to the event, that will learn you for not downloading it earlier. <laughs> now, <laughs> so let's, let's go on. So let's look at the real result, Ed. Uh, mostly agree, actually, was quite strong. The interesting thing about this one is that there is a chunk of people who definitely disagree and a chunk of people who mostly disagree. And one of the things about those two chunks is they get significantly worse when you look at any of the WP factors that we uh, chucked in, the kind of polar proxies that we developed in the research. Um, go on. So what's going on? Uh, a few representative comments. I knew how much travel would cost, but the food at the university and the cost of resources are ridiculously high. Uh, nobody cares enough to explain to you that if you're middle class, you don't get enough money from parents nor from the government. So that sense of squeezed middle for those people who are probably just above the offer bursary thresholds. The only costs explained were those for tuition. The course had additional costs for printing and binding of theses. Uh, at school, I was always told everyone can afford to go to university, but if your parents like mine earn just over the cut-off point for loans, it's actually quite unaffordable. It uh, doesn't take into account that professors would force us to buy their own books or that we, well, we would fail the course. <laughs> um, I looked online and made estimates of everything I needed before I enrolled. So this is, a, this is a good one. And the second one is, I've been on many away days on WP schemes and they all told me the cost of university. Nobody told me Waitrose is more expensive than Lidl. <laughs> Now, people are laughing at that one, but uh, this is a really strong one that comes through from international students in particular, who just don't know some of the things that we perhaps know uh, because we knock about Britain, about how much things cost and how much you ought to be paying for things. So, very quickly, Trendance did some trend analysis in the comments. Dissatisfaction on preparedness for costs is related to a lack of information re what we would call participation costs. So not literally the tuition fee and you putting on your website that you charge 5p for a copy, but a sense of how much everything would cost to participate meaningfully in a programme. Second, a perception that costs levied by a provider are a rip-off. Lots of students believe that uh, a surplus is being made out of them. Uh, and then third, again, and this relates to stuff right at the start, maintenance funding not covering costs. And then satisfaction is related to clear information about direct costs, uh, really clear sense in satisfaction about social capital, those with it uh, are prepared, those without it are not. And then third, access to information, as I said earlier, about real participation costs. Okay, so we also asked some questions about the student loan, um, and we'll rattle through these. Um, did you expect to repay, uh, do you expect to repay your student loan? 49% um, think they will, um, and then 51% not, not, not quite so sure. 
Um, do you expect to repay your loan uh, by the end of the repayment period? Um, roughly a kind of even breakdown there between people who do think they'll pay it off and people who don't. Uh, do you expect to repay your loan? Graduates. Oh, uh, sorry, and then, and then this is recent graduates. Uh, and what you can see as we go through that is that um, when people are thinking of going to university, they're pretty confident that they're going to pay off their loan that they get out. While they're at university, that confidence starts to go a bit. And then once they've graduated, they become pretty clear uh, that they're unlikely to pay it off uh, over the payment time. Um, one of the other things that came through in this is that transparency is really, really important um, to students and it features very heavily um, in SU manifestos um, and the regulatory framework suggests that there'll be uh, some sort of transparency statement. Uh, and so we wanted to test different approaches to transparency. Jim. Uh, so we asked them lots of things. So for instance, we said, what do you think about seeing a breakdown of how your university spends its fee income? Uh, very strong support there, 88%. Um, we asked a bunch of things that were about comparisons, so being able to compare the spend on your course with another course in the provider, uh, the spend of your provider against another provider on similar categories in a, in a kind of similar way than the accounting SORP does and so on. And all of those kind of comparison ones were it, up in the 80s popular. Interestingly, actual raw data was perhaps less popular. So things like seeing the cost of management salaries, this is the moment where a huge part of the room breathes a sigh of relief. <laughs> Although don't be that relieved, it's still 67% folk. 67%, um, so that's lower, as is things like seeing information on the ratio of teaching staff to students. So it's knowing where the money goes and being able to compare that meaningfully that students really care about in the data. Okay. Oh, nearly. So we then asked students, in the second we're going to talk about what should be done. Um, oh, hold on. Yeah. You're going backwards or forward? Well, I was going to go backwards. No, let's just flip that on. Let's, yeah. let's just Perfect. This. So um, we're going to speed through because we are uh, in serious danger of uh, stopping you getting to your lunch. Um, so things that you think uh, could be done, we're looking at um, assessing the overall cost that's spent by students, um, actually giving them value for money. Uh, well, you know, novel ideas are novel. Um, being transparent on where the fee is, fee is spent, telling students what you intend to deliver and then deliver it. I think that's a really key thing, is like following through on what's, what, what you have told students you will do. Um, explain to them what they are getting for the money. So that sense of transparency is really starting to come through. Um, removal of hidden and additional course costs, creating more compelling narratives of what value can be derived, um, and constantly reviewing the student's idea of value for money and having Regulatory mechanisms in universities to manage expectations and match them. Well, that's the most words that uh, I can say that quickly. Um, but I think that, that what you are talking about and what we have got from this research is a sense of transparency around expectation, around really communicating with students about what it is that they sh should be getting from their university experience and making sure that you deliver it. That sense of being um, milked, that sense of being ripped off, um, that sense of subsidising things that you don't quite understand where that money is going, um, but you know that you're, you, you think that you're paying too much, that sense can really uh, change the way that students feel about their university experience. Um, I'm going to stop running through these. Um, I think we have like a couple more slides from these guys, um, mostly a conversation from students, and then we're going to give Nicola a, a second to wrap up. But thank you very much. So we asked students a bunch of uh, questions about what should be done, and I'll give you the opportunity to just kind of read these in the background. Uh, allow students to have more of a say on investments, um, minimum teaching hours, um, appoint an office for students, student rep uh, at each university. Um, publish clear, well explained information on where money is actually spent. Uh, allow students to complete an annual survey every year uh, on what they spend at university. Uh, make universities think about the costs that they charge to students. Um, some of these things are um, extrinsic, so social attitudes and ideology, overall funding model. Um, some of them could be part of the regulatory framework. Do you want to add a bit on that, Jim? Yeah, and, and, and I think what comes to, re you know, I mean, students wrote tons of stuff here. I mean, there was one student that wrote about a thousand words in this box. Um, and I guess what I'd say, you know, just to pick up the thing that Shakira said right at the end, so some of it really isn't about OFS, the OFS, it's not about providers, it's about background ideology and thoughts about, you know, purpose of HE and stuff. But some really is within the ambit of the regulatory 
powers that the OFS has. But even more importantly, some is in the ambit of control and influence of providers. There, are, there, there is stuff that, in partnership with students, that providers could do very, very quickly to address lots of the concerns, particularly on the hygiene factors rather than the motivator factors. And so, you know, the research is out next week, and we would very much encourage you to be working with your student representatives and so on to, to try and get to work on some of the issues they raise. So the final conclusion uh, from us is that probably the best part of my job is getting to work with elected officers. And one of the remarkable things about elected officers and over the next two weeks, half a million students will be voting in SU elections up and down the country, is how quickly they transform from somebody who's written a manifesto about a new football kit and a washing machine in a hall of residence into somebody who can take a vast amount of student feedback and synthesise it into really neat pithy points to go away and make to institutions. So um, we shared this with a few officers from uh, UEA and Middlesex and they came back with seven key themes um, that, they'd, uh, that they'd drawn from it. Jim. So look, first is inputs and outcomes are really important to students. But because inputs are directly a provider's responsibility, whereas outcomes are a shared partnership generated responsibility, it's not surprising perhaps that outcomes are slightly less important on the value for money question than inputs, although they both command significant importance. What isn't, isn't included for the fee comes through really strongly in the comments and the officers were reflecting on that really passionately in both ends of the country. Where the money goes is really important and having an understanding of where the, 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 that is. The cost of taking part rather than just maintenance funding is really important and some of the costs of taking part are under the influence or control of uh, providers and so you know both of our sets of officers in very different types of institutions were reflecting on some of the charges some of the costs you know everything from catering to printing to accommodation and so on and whether efforts could be made to get those costs down transparency comparability the difference between hygiene and motivator factors but the very final thing we want to say is this what comes through in the written comments and from our officers is extraordinary passion and engagement about the ongoing debate. Uh, they're not reductive, they're quite interesting and clever and reflective, but also quite demanding. They're the sorts of comments that you would want from modern graduates that are ready to enter uh, complex careers and a complex world. And I think what we would say is real engagement with students and student representatives on this issue in the year ahead, both from OFS and inside providers, will provide rich fruits in dealing with this value for money question. Thank you, Megan. Thank you, Ed. Thank you, Jim. I thought that was absolutely fascinating. Uh, this research, we're going to publish it next week, uh, and it's going to be taken forward by uh, our student panel, by the Office for Students. Uh, value for money is going to be a, a real priority for us, making sense of it, not only uh, for students, it's value for money for taxpayers, for a broader number of people who invest in higher education in one shape or form, but the student voice has to be absolutely central uh, to how we engage with this subject. So thank you, that was absolutely fantastic. Um...